Good afternoon. I'm Melody Rose, the City Club President, and I would like to welcome all of you here today. Those of you joining us at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio, or those watching on Portland Community Media's Sitting at 30. Thank you very much for joining the City Club today, Friday, March 30th, for our debate. In consideration of those sitting close to you and those on our TV and radio audiences, I'd like to ask everyone in the room to please silence your various devices. Today we will hear from Amanda Fritz and Mary Nolan, two candidates running for commissioner of Portland City Council seat number one. But first, just a few announcements. City Club's corporate and media partners are essential to the ongoing vitality and sustainability of all of the club's wonderful activities. I'd like to give a generous thanks to our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, and a very deep appreciation to all of the Friday Forum corporate sponsors. Morell Inc., who has two tables with us here today, Bank of the Cascades, Miller Nash, Perkins Coie, Stoll Reeves, and The Standard. This is the final Friday Forum in this quarter, so we want to give a special thank you to all of you who have been supporting our activities and to all of those who in the room who might consider supporting these activities. If you'd like to look into corporate membership, please do see our staff at the back of the room on your way out. Throughout the year, City Club hosts intelligent and civil presentations and conversations about the most vexing issues of our times. In an era of 30-second sound bites, in-depth discussion of today's pressing issues is needed more now than ever before. It is gifts from our members and supporters that make all of these activities possible. And this month, the City Club's Leadership Circle donors upped the ante. These members pledged second gifts, totaling $10,000, in hopes that the rest of the community would match their generosity. With your help, City Club can close the gap and make our challenge of an annual $100,000 fund drive. If you value the quality of the programming that you experience here and the influential research that inspires and informs citizens and policymakers alike, please get involved and donate today. You can use one of the envelopes on your table or of course, visit with our staff at the back of the room. And now to introduce today's moderator. Today's moderator is Jim Westwood. Jim is a partner at the firm of Stoll Reeves, where he concentrates his practice in state and federal appellate courts. He has handled important appeals in state and federal constitutional law, insurance, banking, and energy. Jim, please join us. In the interest of balance, I'll use this podium. Thank you to City Club for giving me this privilege to be your moderator today. And thank you to the two candidates who I think you're going to really enjoy hearing from, Amanda Fritz and Mary Nolan. Now I see there's coffee on all the tables. I invite you to use it to stay awake while I describe the format that we're going to have today. The debate has several sections. First, each candidate will give us a three minute opening statement in an order previously determined by a coin toss, which means that Amanda Fritz will open today's debate with her opening statement, followed by Mary Nolan. Then following the opening statements, the candidates will respond to questions that have been written in advance of this meeting by the City Club's Friday Forum Committee and City Club staff. I have seen these questions, they are wonderful. The candidates have not seen them. These are the only questions that are going to be asked today. In other words, no questions from the floor. We then will rely, well, throughout the debate, we're going to rely on the judgment of a distinguished panel seated in front of me, City Club members, um, to decide whether or not a particular candidate has answered the question that has been asked of her. So if two or more of the three panel members believe the question has not been adequately or ans sufficiently answered, uh, they will then hold up, would you please do so and show me what you have there, question mark cards, meaning question. Um, and that, in that event, the candidate will be allowed another 30 seconds to have a mulligan and do a retake and attempt to answer the question. If, and the, the panel is free to, even then to raise their question mark signs again, but the uh, candidate will not have an opportunity at that point to speak further. Um, each question response, the initial response 
response time is 60 seconds, and again, the, the time to respond if the question marks go up is 30 seconds for the candidates. Okay. Um, the candidate, oh, let's see, where are we here? Well, I've already explained all that. Let me introduce our panel to you. Uh, on our panel, we have, and they are distinguished, Joyce DeMonin, Pat McCormick, and Ken Ray. And keeping time today and keeping me honest, at the table where I'll be sitting is Tony Iaccarino. Now, following City Club's questions, each candidate will then have the opportunity to ask her opponent one question and will then make a three-minute closing statement. The order of closing will be the same as the order of opening. Ms. Fritz goes first, followed by Ms. Nolan. Now, I know I don't need to say this to a City Club audience. Please be respectful of the candidates, but I may need to tell you this one. Please hold your applause until the end of the program. We're on a tight schedule here, and uh, as the candidates come to their podiums, by all means, please greet them, and at the close, please show them your appreciation for their having come here today. I will now introduce the candidates in the order in which they're going to be speaking. First is Amanda Fritz. Ms. Fritz was elected to the Portland City Council in 2008, and on the council, she has served as commissioner in charge of neighborhood involvement, emergency communications, Healthy Working Rivers, and the Office of Equity and Human Rights. Prior to her election, Ms. Fritz was a registered nurse who worked for 22 years in inpatient psychiatry at OHSU, and she also served on the Portland Planning Commission for seven years. Ms. Fritz graduated from Cambridge University in England with a master's degree in biological sciences. She spent 17 years volunteering in the Portland Public Schools as she raised three children who all graduated from the Portland public education system. Mary Nolan currently represents District 36 in the Oregon House of Representatives, where she has acted as co-chair of the Ways and Means Committee. Previously, she acted as the city's director of environmental services. She founded an electronics company in Portland to develop new technology for aviation, and she was elected chair of the NASA Industry Advisory Council. She was a consumer advocate on the Oregon Construction Contractors Board, and she chaired the Portland Private Industry Council. She also was in the first class of women admitted to Dartmouth College. Yes, both of our participants today are undereducated. Um, Ms. Nolan graduated from Dartmouth with a degree in mathematics. Her volunteer work includes leadership roles at Planned Parenthood, the New Rose Theater, and the League of Women Voters, along with several local schools. So with that, if I may invite the candidates to the podium, please welcome them, and we'll begin with the opening statements. Ms. Fritz, three minutes for your opening statement. It is an honor to be invited here to talk about Portland, what I've accomplished in my first three years serving on the Portland City Council, and what I will do if re-elected. I was born and raised in England, but I came to Portland as fast as I could. My husband and I relocated here in 1986 after a nationwide search to find the best place to live and raise a family. I was an OHSU nurse for 22 years working in inpatient psychiatry. Ten years ago, I became a union leader during the nurses' 56-day strike, winning living wages for nursing and protecting patient safety. I understand the needs of hardworking Portlanders. I pay attention to details about city projects and spending to make sure taxpayers' money is spent wisely. Careful use of resources often results in better services for citizens. I'm working with the police, 911, and county mental health care specialists to provide better services for people experiencing mental illnesses, avoiding conflicts with police. This crucial project has made some improvements in the system, but it is not finished. I am uniquely qualified to continue to guide this work. My three children each received excellent education in Portland's public schools. Despite cutting the city's budget during the recession these past three years, I have supported targeted school funding which improved graduation rates and allocated general fund resources for community college scholarships and summer internships. I will continue to prioritize assistance to public schools to prepare our children for jobs and to provide employers with a well-educated workforce. I am the Gateway Area Business Association's Citizen of the Year 
chosen by the superintendents of the Park Rose, David Douglas, and Portland Adventist schools. I coordinated Council's action to co-locate personnel and streamline permitting in the Bureau of Development Services. I worked to achieve Council consensus to share the use of public spaces on downtown sidewalks. I am challenging the Oregon Liquor Control Commission's policies on liquor licenses, which impact the livability of our neighborhoods. I have been the champion of transparent government and effective public process. I act as the fiscally responsible watchdog on the Council. I saved ratepayers $6 million a year by persuading the Council not to build a $700 million filtration plant for our precious, pure, bull run water. I was the lone no vote on the Lake As We Go streetcar, a project which is now on hold. We can't afford it right now. I cut $2.1 million in interest costs for the fire bond by paying off the debt faster. I oversaw an audit that collected $2 million in additional general fund revenue from a franchise customer. I helped get the Selwood Bridge funded in partnership with the county and other jurisdictions. I have worked well with the other members of the council to get things done for Portlanders despite the challenges of the recession. I hope by the end of today's forum, you'll agree that I have earned re-election. Ms. Nola, your opening statement. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Nolan. As you consider whether to give me your vote for city council, let me tell you just some of the results I've already delivered to improve the lives of Portlanders as a clear indication of the results I will deliver at City Hall. As co-founder of Oregon NARAL and chair of Planned Parenthood, I built a broad coalition to protect the right to choose and to build health clinics for low-income families. As Portland's Director of Environmental Services, I brought together ratepayers, small business owners, major polluters, along with river users and environmentalists to forge the plan to clean up the Willamette River and Columbia Slough. Today, it is again safe to swim in our river, in large part because of my ability to turn those opposing interests into collaborators. I started an electronics company here in Portland. We developed new technology that helped change the aviation industry, and we created middle-class jobs with good benefits. As co-chair of the legislature's Public Safety Committee, I worked with two Republican colleagues to prevent crime before it happens. We expanded drug and alcohol treatment, and we increased re-entry programs for prisoners. As majority leader in the Oregon House, I helped craft a solution with hospitals, insurance companies, and children's advocates to bring preventive health care to more than 80,000 uninsured Oregon kids. Portland has done wonderful, important things, but this choice for city council is not really about our past as much as it is about our future. And who has the ability to lead us and a record of delivering results on really tough challenges, like a transportation system that works for everyone instead of crumbling into disarray, like support for businesses that are already here, especially manufacturers, as well as startups like mine was, so they can expand and hire more Portlanders. Instead of bureaucracy and talk, real targets and hard deadlines for bringing communities of color and those in the recently annexed areas of Portland into their fair share of Portland's livability. I don't pretend to have a magic wand or to be able to do all this urgent work alone. In everything, I've built coalitions, working successfully with people who know things I don't and who see the world differently than I do. And because I bring a solid team approach and the collaborative skills necessary for city commissioner, Together, we've delivered big results, and I'm anxious to do more for you. Thank you, Ms. Nolan. Now we'll move to the portion of the program where I will ask questions prepared by the Friday Forum Committee. As I mentioned, the candidates have not seen these questions in advance. We'll begin with one question, which will be for both of the candidates. That is, each candidate gets to respond to this first question, and then we'll move to individualized questions for the candidates. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to respond to each question. We'll begin with Ms. Nolan, but this question I, I say again is for both of you. 
The presidential campaign recently featured the notion that a candidate's beliefs could be as freely adjusted as, say, the images on an Etch-a-Sketch. What are two core values that are unchangeable for you, and can you point to particular actions you've taken during your career that support those values? Ms. Nolan first. Thank you. Tolerance and education. On tolerance, I introduced legislation to prohibit bullying in schools. I helped move the civil unions bill and the non-discrimination bill through the legislature. I expanded opportunities for minority-owned businesses to do work throughout the state of Oregon. On education, I doubled the amount of college scholarships available to our kids and made them available to part-time students for the first time because some people can't go to college unless they work full-time to support their families. I was a volunteer on virtually every school bond measure, including the two last spring for Portland Public Schools and Park Rose Schools. I am deeply committed to a community that is tolerant and inviting for everyone and where everyone gets the education they deserve. Ms. Fritz, your response? My two core values are equity and inclusion and being real and honest. On equity, I'm moving forward. We've done enough studies. It's time for action. I've established the Office of Equity and Human Rights and hired a director after a nationwide search to move us forward and correct the horrible disparities that we see in our, in our city, where people of color and people with disabilities are doing worse now than they were 15 years ago, and they're doing worse here than they are in any other major American city. That's not who we are as Portlanders. That's not what we want to be. We've done a lot of, spent a lot of money trying to address this issue over the past 20 years, and we haven't succeeded. We need to recognize that and do something about it, and that's what I'm doing with the Office of Equity. Secondly, being real and being honest. I am who I am. I am not an Etch-a-Sketch candidate. I say the same things in every forum. I live the values that I was elected on, spending taxpayers' money wisely and prioritizing jobs and schools. That's who I am, and that's why I want to continue working on the Portland City Council. Now, in, uh, in alternation, I will ask each uh, candidate two questions, um, which she, but not her opponent, will respond to. And as before, you'll each have 60 seconds to respond to the question I ask you. So this is a question just for Ms. Fritz. As the first non-incumbent recipient of public campaign financing for your successful 2008 City Council campaign, what do you consider your most important contributions, that is, your return on the taxpayer's investment for the $350,000 that was invested in you? I thank you for the question. I live voter-owned elections and public campaign financing. The most significant vote was saving $6 million a year went by persuading the council not to move forward with the filtration system for Bull Run Water. I didn't have to think about who had funded my election. I didn't have to think about the unions or the contractors who would be getting that money in the contracts for that. I persuaded all five members of the council to change direction and in one vote saved $500 million. And I went home that evening and said to my three kids who were home from college, kids, I saved the ratepayers $500 million. And my oldest said, that's great, mom, what's for dinner? <laughs> And then it got worse because the next day I happened to be home again, which is unusual, and he said, so how much did I, you save me today, Mom? <laughs> so I worked it out, and for the 1,461 days that I will be in office my first term, that's $342,000 a day. And I did that because I wanted to save the ratepayers money, and I believe that that ratepayer money spent on electing me was well spent. A question for Ms. Nolan. In your announcement that you would be challenging Ms. Fritz for this seat on the City Council, you wrote that your campaign is about, and I quote, actually getting important things done, not just talking about getting things done, close quote. What specifically do you believe you offer that Ms. Fritz doesn't? And what important things are not getting done now, in your opinion? Thanks, Jim. I think I started to answer that question in my opening comments, but there's more. The significant distinction is that I work things through to conclusion. I'm focused on fixing things. I talked about my investment in college scholarships, my work on expanding health care access for children. I led the Environmental Services Bureau to design a plan to clean up the Willamette River. I changed the way the Oregon Youth Authority provides services 
so that we reduced the cost but increased the benefits. Kids are now returning to communities better able to live successfully, independently, without hurting anyone in their communities again. I worked on increasing access to public services for, for communities of color. I have delivered results for the pro-choice community, built health clinics, supported the arts, supported schools. I'm sorry I've run out of time. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Fritz, a question for you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I saw question marks there. Really? Okay, you haven't run out of time. You have 30 seconds. The question again is, let me see, here we are. What specifically do you believe you offer that Ms. Fritz doesn't, Ms. Fritz doesn't and what important things are not getting done now in your opinion? 30 seconds. What important things that are not getting done now are maintenance of basic services in the city. A transportation system, for example, that we've decided we're not going to maintain. It's a $5 billion asset that the taxpayers of Portland have invested to, to build and maintain, and it's not being maintained. Utility systems that aren't being adequately operated and managed to serve Portlanders and the entire region. Solving problems and delivering solutions instead of studying them and measuring how bad things are. Now for Ms. Fritz, a question. You portray yourself as a friend of labor, yet your opponent has gained the endorsements of Portland firefighters and police and the state, county, and municipal employees, Local 189, the labor unions that represent city employees. How do you explain the fact that these and other unions have uh, not chosen to endorse you in this race? I watch out for the taxpayers and the ratepayers of Portland, and sometimes that makes, means making tough decisions on city jobs. I'm responsible for this year's budget, and so other candidates may be able to promise that we can find money out of nowhere, but I know that that money isn't there. So I have to be honest, as I said earlier, that um, we don't have enough money to pay for all the basic services that I would like to provide. I am endorsed by the Communication Workers of America, Madeline Elder is here today, by the Oregon Nurses Association, by the United Food and Commercial Workers, and by the Portland Area Teach Association of Teachers. So I certainly have my share of union endorsements. I'm looking out for all the taxpayers and ratepayers of Portland, and I make decisions that sometimes will be unpopular with the city unions. There's particular issues with police and fire, which I won't go into here. And now a question from Ms. Nolan, yeah. in perhaps the same vein. Candidates who seek endorsements from unions, nonprofits, and policy organizations are often asked to fill out questionnaires explaining their policy positions on issues those organizations care about. Willamette Week has reported that you selectively declined to release your response to at least one union questionnaire. The question is, shouldn't the general public be entitled to see how you've represented yourself on all of those questionnaires and not just the ones you choose to release? I disagree with the premise of the question. The conversation is between me and a group of people. I am absolutely transparent about the positions I take, the votes I cast. I've cast over 6,000 votes in my legislative career. Every single one of them is open to the public. In some of them, I voted with the teachers union, for example, and in some, I have voted directly against their interests, and yet they're supporting me. I'm supported by home builders and by the founder of 1,000 Friends. Both of them know that I will not agree with them on everything, and yet they're supporting me. My voting record, my legislative career is completely transparent, and there's no evidence that I've ever cast a vote that was compromised because of support or a contribution that I've received. We'll now return to asking both candidates the same question. That is, each candidate will have 60 seconds to respond in turn to the question I ask. And this is a question for Ms. Fritz to answer first. Portland is one of the few large cities left in the nation that has retained the commission form of government, where city commissioners are given executive authority to run city bureaus. Most of Portland's counterparts have, over time, rejected this system, moving instead to a strong mayor or city manager system arguably to create efficiency and improve coordination of city services. Let me interject at this point that City Club is on record as supporting continuation of the commission system. But now the question, would you support moving away from the commission form of government, and why or why not? 
I am a lot less thrilled with the commission form of government than I was three years ago. <laughs> I get blamed for things like transportation, which is not my bureau, and which I have a, a limited ability to affect the budget. Although, as I say, I did make a, a huge change in the budget for the Water Bureau, which was also not my bureau. I have worked to make the commission form of government work better. I work well with all four of my colleagues. You're always going to have five strong personalities on the Portland City Government. That can work really well. I like being in charge of the bureaus, that I then am the champion for those bureaus. I get to understand the issues in those bureaus. And I also recognize that we need to work better between the portfolios. So I've worked well with Dan Saltzman, who is here today and supporting my reelection on environmental services issues in the Superfund. I've worked with Commissioner Nick Fish on housing and parks, and he's also supporting my reelection. And I've had a lot of collaboration with Mayor Adams on planning issues and on just a lot of the things that we do. We work together in the Portland City Council, and I'm proud of that. Ms. Nolan, your response, 60 seconds. I'm aware of the City Club's position on that, but the examination of this issue that I really wish could have happened is the Charter Review Commission that just completed its work. Required under City Charter, the panel was given direction from the City Council, including Commissioner Fritz, to limit their discussion to kind of housekeeping issues. Don't take on any of the big stuff. Don't examine the structure of government. I think that's exactly the place we ought to have that conversation, in the public with volunteers who are asked to, to recommend a form of government. I would like to hear what those citizens have to say, and then I'd like to follow their lead. Another question for both candidates, and Ms. Nolan, you may respond okay. to this one first. It is difficult for many Portland taxpayers to understand how the city determines spending priorities that seem to shortchange core services in favor of under other spending. Mm -hmm. For example, the Portland Transportation Bureau is shaving millions of dollars from its upcoming budget cycle, but the Oregonian recently reported that the city council, and I quote, redirected $250,000 from the current transportation budget to buy fancy planters and street lights for the downtown retail core. The question, in your view, is the city making appropriate spending decisions? And if not, where can we best improve services while reducing costs? Thanks, and I do think transportation is a huge issue. I think public safety budgets are a huge issue as well, where we are ignoring some of the most pressing needs. I directed the City's Bureau of, of Public Works Maintenance. Those are the folks who used to maintain the streets, used to repave the streets when the city did that. We had a regular schedule of resurfacing, repaving the streets, because we valued the $5 billion investment the taxpayers had made. And we valued the mobility that that represented for businesses, people going to work, people going to recreation, and kids trying to get to school. We need to get back to a place where we are investing in basic services that really underpin the livability of our neighborhoods. In public, I'm sorry. Go in ahead. public safety, we need to really be investing in training so that our officers and first responders are prepared to deal with the very difficult situations that they run into nowadays when they're called out on emergencies. I'm sorry I interrupted you, Ms. Okay. Nolan. Ms. Fritz, your response? Could you repeat the question, yes. please? In your view, is the city making appropriate spending decisions? And if not, where can we best improve services while reducing costs? I sometimes agree with city spending, the council's majority spending decisions, and sometimes not. I was the only member of the council to vote against the Water Bureau budget rate increase in 2010 and 2011 because I felt that there could be more efficiencies there and wiser use of the right pairs money. I voted against establishing the bike share project using Metro's money, which is supposed to, or federal money, which is supposed to be used for infrastructure and basic safety improvements. Instead, the council chose to do a downtown bike rental project. Um, so sometimes yes and sometimes no. What I always do is think about, is this wise use of taxpayers' money? Is it wise use of ratepayers' money? What are the priorities? So we, I did support spending $7.1 million of the gas tax money that we got from increase from the state on fixing the Selwood Bridge. It has a safety rating out of two out of, a, of 100. And it's important that we fix our crumbling infrastructure and we provide those basic services, recognizing, too, that we have been cutting services with cutting the city budget. 
Another question for both candidates, first for Ms. Fritz. For some, privatization of government services is the cornerstone of an overall goal of shrinking government. To others, it's more of a temporary solution to current government budget challenges. What, if any, current city services really belong in the private sector or could be temporarily privatized to save money? That's an interesting question. I was expecting what should be remain public service jobs. There are some things that we do we can do with nonprofit partners in particular, where funding programs through the nonprofits can be much more cost effective, and indeed they are the experts. So we have great partnerships with Central City Concern, with transition projects, with other community organizations that we are not in managing the contracts, we, well, we manage the contracts, but we aren't in charge of implementing the programs. So those are the kinds, that's, that's one service that is better done by the experts in the community. What I was going to answer was that there are other services that are much better done by public sector workers where we need to provide ongoing jobs with benefits and that we need to let citizens know that we are providing, we're going to be providing those services ongoing without relying on private enterprise in the community. Ms. Nolan? Thank you. A few things I think appropriately can be contracted to experts outside city employment. Short-term project management, for example, whether that's engineering design or construction. Because it's short-term, you don't want to hire up that expertise only to then lay them off. And particularly very specialized expertise, whether it's in economics or technical issues, computer things, where you don't have an ongoing need for that service, I think it's responsible to hire experts in the community to do that. But let's be clear about the premise by those who propose to privatize public services. It's intended to undermine the credibility of public services, to undermine the credibility of the people who bring expertise, dedication, loyalty, and experience to their jobs every day. And I'm not having any of it. Thank you. Now this question for both candidates will go first to you, Ms. Nolan. Thank you. The Federal Department of Labor puts the Portland-Vancouver metropolitan area unemployment rate at 8.5% as of this past January. What is the single most cost-effective, fast-acting thing that Portland's city government could do to grow jobs? I've heard a lot about this in the last six months because I've gone around Portland and listened to business owners and people who want to invest in Portland. And I ask them, what one or two things could City Hall do to make it more likely that you will expand your payroll here in Portland? And here's what I get in response. Give us regulatory certainty. Don't change the rules on us. Don't make us hunt around to get the answer we want from a different person on the staff. Secondly, give us very quick turnaround. We're actually happy to pay the cost of the permits and the review if you give us an answer quickly enough because the time they waste waiting for clear answers from city services is time that delays their ability to expand their business, hire more people, and lift this economic boat up. Ms. Fritz? I disagree a little with the premise of the question that uh, there's a single one thing which is a magic bullet because I think it's, a, it's not one thing, it's all day, every day thinking about different strategies to improve businesses and increase jobs. Most of our businesses are small businesses, so we need to find ways to support them as we do through the Small Business Advisory Council and the Small Business Development Center at PCC. So that, I think, has been an extremely helpful strategy in actually increasing employment. That, that study that you mentioned showed that we've gained 6,800 jobs in Multnomah County over the last year at the same time as cutting 1,700 government jobs. So it's a range of, of city programs, including looking at the tax structure and in, increasing the owner exemption for small businesses to 125,000. We haven't been able to do, move as fast on that in the recession as I would have liked, but I remain committed to doing that and looking at the range of city programs that can provide support in the ways that the businesses need rather than the way the government thinks we should do it. Uh, Ms. Fritz, this uh, will be first for you and then for Ms. Nolan. There's a long preamble, bear with me. 
Portland's fire, police, disability, and retirement system continues to place extraordinary pressure on the city's budget because of the system's estimated underfunded, unfunded liability of over two and a half billion, that's right, billion dollars, just for existing police and fire beneficiaries. Many police and fire personnel are nearing retirement age and will begin to draw out their pensions. A 2006 City Club report recommending major changes prompted some progress on implementing improvements, but the unfunded liability remains. What would you do, if anything, to address the unfunded liability in the fire, police, disability, and retirement system? The voters did do a charter change, which has been very helpful and made some progress. One thing about this city council is that we don't sit back and stop whenever something passes. We keep working on it to, make, to find out, have we succeeded? Have we gotten to where we need to be? Or do we need to keep working on it? So Commissioner Dan Saltzman and his team are working with the newly revised board of the Fire, Police, and Disability System to probably propose some more charter changes to the voters in November. Those folks are the experts on this issue. I know that Commissioner Saltzman is working on it diligently. Um, set up the Charter Commission so that it could consider other issues in addition to the ones that Council asked it to do. And the Charter Commission chose not to address this particular issue, but the Council can forward measures to the voters in November by ourselves, and that's probably what we will be doing. I can't tell you, despite fearing the dreaded City Club question marks, exactly what those would be. <laughs> I saw no question marks. Ms. Nolan, your response. I mentioned some of the answer that we need to have here, and that's better training. Because when we're talking about on-the-job injuries, a lot of that derives from not adequately trained personnel, none of their fault, or in inadequately equipped personnel out in the field. And we need to address those issues as well. Secondly, City Council, through its executive leadership, should be negotiating fair, public-minded contracts in a way that brings both parties to the table to find a solution together. Tossing charter amendments back out there instead of sitting around a table, understanding each other's point of view, and finding a way to meet in the middle ends up getting into a contentious arena that I don't think serves the public well, and it certainly doesn't serve the people who depend on the emergency responders well at all. One question mark only, not enough for a, a quorum, so we'll go on to the next question. Um, this is a question to you, Ms. Nolan. Thanks. The Portland, I'm sorry, it's for both of you, but Ms. Nolan first. The Portland Police Bureau is currently under federal investigation for a significant increase in police shootings over the past 18 months, particularly of people with mental illness. What would be the number one recommendation you would make to our incoming mayor to decrease the number of armed confrontations between police and community members. I wish I had an answer to this question. There are people much smarter about public safety, interactions, training, preparation, the dynamics of the situation, who have struggled with this authentically and diligently, so I can't in 60 seconds tell you that I can answer this problem that has faced us for several years, if not decades. But I will tell you that the approach I would encourage the mayor to take is to take away any blaming, take away any finger pointing, and bring parties together to address the issue to understand the real factual basis behind the circumstances and to find a solution together. But I don't know what that answer is yet. Ms. Fritz. I've been working on this issue for two years and worrying about it for the 22 years that I was at OHSU working in inpatient psychiatry. I'm working with the Safer PDX project, which is a collaborative work with Commissioner Judy Shiprack, who's here today, the county mental health system, and the police, doing exactly that, looking at it without blame, and, but how can we make things safer for people experiencing mental illnesses in our community? Part of that is getting it upstream and funding programs and facilities so that people have options to get help before they get into crisis, and so I'm hoping to get that funded this year. Part of it is revising police policies to 
change the way that they deal with people experiencing crisis in the, in the community. We started with that, but we're talking about people's lives here, both the police and the firefighters and other first responders and those experiencing mental illnesses. So we need to be really careful. If there's one thing that I'm going to be asking the new mayor, it's to continue to assign me to work on this project. This question is first for you, Ms. Fritz, then to Ms. Nolan. On Monday, two men were arrested in connection with the 30th gang shooting of this year, and it's only the end of March. The Youth and Gang Violence Steering Committee notes that coordination, communication, and attention to preventing violence can demonstrably reduce the rate of youth violence. They recommended that law enforcement be combined with a broader, more comprehensive approach. As a member of the City Council, what specific steps would you recommend to reduce the incidence of gang violence in Portland? We need to provide alternatives for youth in particular and older, other adults to have gainful employment and meaningful ways to participate productively in life in Portland. So that's why I've per, I have supported funding and reorganized in my own portfolio how we do graffiti abatement services, providing grants for youth to help with those, those services over some, by getting summer internships. We need to make sure that people in the community get the services that they need so that they are not feeling desperate and wanting to join gangs. And we need to provide the support to both the gang enforcement uh, groups and to all of the community services, including those in the county, working together to coordinate what we're doing. And it isn't any one particular thing, again. It's working on scholarships. It's working on keeping kids in school. It's providing adequate numbers of teachers so that the teachers know when the kid is in school and when they're not in school and can follow up on that. It's a range. It's looking at this pro pro problem holistically, which is what I do. Ms. Nolan, your response. It's no mystery that the biggest thing we can do to change the trajectory of some of these kids is to make sure from the very beginning they get an exceptional education, starting with early childhood and parenting programs for their parents, making sure we've got schools and after school programs that give them something to be involved in, supporting programs like Friends of the Children who provide mentorship for young kids who are at risk from the time they're in elementary school until they graduate from high school, giving these kids real models of what it's like to grow up and have a job and take care of yourself and giving them the hope and actually the expectation that they will have a better life if they pursue education and getting a good job than if they hang out on the street corner and deal in drugs. A question for both candidates, first to Ms. Nolan. This question comes from the City Club's New Leaders Council. They ask, over the last several years, Portland has attracted an increasing number of new young residents. But despite this, 25 to 39 year olds are often underrepresented in local decision making processes. So what strategies would you propose to improve young adult engagement in our community? Well, one of the things I've done already is I spend time with the student associations at our colleges, Portland State, community, uh, Portland Community College, getting kids registered to vote giving them an explanation of what it means, standing up in front of them and saying, if you don't vote, people who look like me will be making decisions about your life instead of you. That's an important first step, getting them to feel that they've got an ownership stake in this community just like we do. The other way to get them involved in policy issues in discussions at the neighborhood level is to make sure we're meeting them on their terms and on their turf. Don't expect them to come down to City Hall or come down to Salem to weigh in on an issue. Go to where they are. Go to the college campuses. Go to the community centers. Go to the places where young people hang out and give them an opportunity to know what's at stake and give us their ideas. Ms. Fritz, your response. Even through these dark times of the recession, I've supported funding for programs that engage youth in our decision-making processes. The Portland Plan, which is coming to Council on April 18th for more review, is a place where the, the planners have gone out to the community, to the schools, to the neighborhoods, to communities of color, and 
sought input in a very real and meaningful way, including funding youth planners who facilitate some of those table discussions at the Portland plan. So giving, not only giving opportunities, but giving employment to youth in city business. We do summer internships and apprenticeships at the city of Portland so that we, youth get an opportunity to see what all the various bureaus of the city do and might be persuaded to be part of getting a good job at the city government. I support the Multnomah County Youth Commission. I have a, a liaison who comes to my office every month and I go to her events in the community. So it is a matter of going where people are. And my time is nearly up. I'll return now to the format in which we ask each speaker a question which she herself will answer. We'll have one question for each of you and the first is for you, Ms. Fritz. The Office of Equity Work Plan includes such activities as build collaborative relationships with other city bureaus, provide assistance to other bureaus on sustainable methods to build capacity, and build on and learn from previous equity building work. What actual tangible results will be produced with the Office of Equity's proposed 2012 budget of more than a million dollars? Much, much of that. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? The end of yeah. the question, what was the what, year? What actual, what actual tangible results will be produced with the Office of Equity's proposed 2012 budget? 2012, thank you. So we actually don't have a work plan yet. What you just outlined are some of the suggestions in the Portland plan that the Office of Equity could work on. I have just hired the expert who's going to help get that work plan developed uh, within three months. It will be done by the end of the fiscal year. We have cons that million dollar budget includes consolidating five staff from other bureaus to work specifically on the equity issues, identifying the benchmarks and starting to get measurable results. Our council over the past three years has required the bureaus to report their spending in the budget discussions on where, the, where geographically they have been spending money and also on the hiring practices so that how many women and minority are in positions in those bureaus. So we've got a lot of data and the Office of Equity is going to be evaluating that data in a very rapid time frame and putting forward a work plan. I just had a presentation at council on Wednesday introducing Dante James, the new director, in which he outlined that work plan, but it's, I can't tell you exactly what's going to be in it because it's not done yet. I saw two question marks. Oh so good, I, like to, I like to talk about equity. I didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> to respond, what actual tangible results will be produced with the Office of Equity's proposed 2012 budget? What the Office of Equity is going to do and has already started doing is ensuring equal opportunity and fairness for all Portlanders. So all Portlanders have opportunities for city contracts, jobs, and services. So we have done a lot of good work on the equity issues over the, the years, but they haven't achieved the results that we need to see in the community. So that this office is going to be focused on that. It's going to be directly under my command, and we're going to make sure that we get to outcomes by the end of this year, and also a lot of more specifics by the end of the next four years. Now a question, Ms. Nolan, for you. 2010 census data show that over 70% of Portland's population identifies as white, making Portland one of the least ethnically diverse metropolitan areas in the country. However, between 2000 and 2010, Portland saw a nearly 40% increase in Hispanic, Pacific Islander, Asian, and other minority populations. Your opponent is known for her work in diversity issues. What would you do to ensure that Portland citizens of color have opportunities equaling those of the majority population? Sorry, but I have to go back to that last one. I just heard her say that nine months into this year, she doesn't have a work plan for an agency with a million dollar budget. Now to your question, diversity and inclusion. I have, as Director of Environmental Services, Director of Public Works Maintenance, dramatically increased the participation of people of color and women in non-traditional jobs in both of those agencies at the same time that we improved the efficiency of those services and cut costs. I've worked at the state level with the Oregon Association of Minority Enterprise, ent and, um, Entrepreneurs, easy for me to say, in expanding access to major contracts as well as smaller contracts that state agencies provide to improve the ability of those businesses to build wealth in their own communities. And as I said, I helped sponsor the Non-Discrimination Act and creation of civil unions 
which expands access for other people in our community. Thank you. Now we're having a new format here, a new portion of our format, and the question mark people can put down their cards because they won't be used here. During this portion of the program, this is really the debate. Each candidate will have the opportunity to ask the other candidate one question. Questions must be asked within 30 seconds. Um, Ms. Fritz will begin the questioning. The candidate to whom the question is directed will have one minute to respond, after which the questioner will then have the option of a 30-second rebuttal. So Ms. Fritz, your 30-second question to Ms. Nolan. Mary, you and I have supported programs that train women on how to be successful in politics. 100 years after women won the vote in Oregon, please talk about what you see are the challenges women, for women in politics and what we need to do to achieve greater parity in political office, particularly on the Portland City Council. 60 Thank seconds. You. Thank you for that question. There is only one person in this state who th I think has done more to help elect and mentor women candidates for public office, and that's Governor Barbara Roberts, who is supporting me. Thank you. She deserves it. What I've done, as I said, is chair the board of Planned Parenthood, which has a leadership development program specifically to help women get ready to take leadership roles in the public sector, including elective office. I chaired the Women's Investment, I'm sorry, Women's Investment Network PAC, WINPAC, which is expressly dedicated to mentoring, recruiting, and helping fund women candidates win election to legislative offices, and then help them move from that into other positions. Jewel Lansing, who was one of the co-founders of WINPAC and a former city auditor is here in the audience, she's also endorsing me. Ms. Fritz, you have 30 seconds optional to rebut. We did not actually answer my question. I wish I had a question mark, which was, what can we do to achieve gender parity in political office, particularly on the Portland City Council? I'm the seventh woman ever to serve on the Portland City Council. And my answer to my question would be, we can support voter-owned elections. When I stood up here with Commissioner Saltzman in 2006, he said that he thought that voter-owned elections was fine for women and minorities, but that he didn't need it. I was really um, incensed at the time, but I've since come to understand why he said that. That for some of us, fundraising is not what we do well, and I don't think you need to be able to do it well in order to be successful on the Portland City Council. Ms. Nolan, your 30-second question to Ms. Fritz. Thanks. When you had the opportunity to oversee an upgrade of the 911 system, as reported in the press, you seem to omit or ignore input from key stakeholders in the project planning. As a result, in too many cases, significant problems that are well documented, like responders being sent to the wrong address, officers not being able to read the information on the screen, arose. Why did you exclude these experts from the design of such a critical system? The question is so filled with misinformation, it's hard to know where to begin. We had an ongoing uh, relationship with the user board, which is all of the users of the system who chose the system and helped implement it. This is the first computer system in the history, the recent history of the city of Portland, which was delivered on time, under budget, and it works. And it does not put public safety at risk. I'm a nurse, I would not do that. And I worked in partnership with Commissioner Leonard and with our providers to work through the issues. It's a new computer. Think of the computer that you had 17 years ago. The old computer had green letters on a black screen. That was it. The new computer has maps which will increase public safety and increase provider safety by showing where the police cars are. And the, the police cars have in their individual cars a map of where their colleagues are so they know whether there's backup close or not. That's also available to the staff in the 911 center. There are so many improvements with this computer, it did take some time to work through the issues, and it's now working really well. Ms. Nolan, 30 seconds for rebuttal. The evidence is really clear. Emergency responders sent to wrong addresses. Officers who couldn't read critical information on the screens in their vehicles. Firefighters arriving at a burning building without vital data about the building's layout. All of it well documented. These are not technicalities. They're failures of leadership that put lives at risk. Portlanders didn't just want this project to be done on time. They wanted it to work. Candidates, we'll move now to your closing statements. You'll each have three minutes, and we will begin 
with Ms. Prince. Thank you to the City Club, to everyone present today and those watching and listening at home on Oregon Public Broadcasting and Portland Community Media. It's impossible to summarize three years work in two minute sound bouts over the course of an hour, just like it's impossible to define a work plan to fix problems that have been building for centuries in the equity issues within nine months before you hire your expert to do that. Please visit my website, amanda2012.com, for more information. Like me on Facebook or send me an email with your questions. I've answered over 20,000 emails myself from constituents over the past three years. When re-elected, I will continue to expand personal relationships with Portlanders. By calling my office, anyone can make an appointment to come talk to me about anything you want. Portland is a place where you can connect directly with your city government, especially with Amanda Fritz. I was a community organizer in Portland for 20 years before I won election, and I remain connected to communities all over Portland. I strive to be your voice in City Hall. I'm a different kind of politician. I was elected with public campaign financing. I represent all Portlanders. And keeping to the spirit of voter-owned elections by limiting contributions to $50 per person and refusing any money from corporations, special interests, or unions. I've incidentally saved a number of the folks in this room a boatload of money by that policy. <laughs> I am proud to be endorsed by the Oregon Nurses Association, the Communication Workers of America, the United Food and Commercial Workers, and the Amer Portland Association of Teachers, as well as the Sierra Club, NARAL Pro Chairs Oregon, the Oregon Progressive Party, and the Portland Green Party. Basic Rights Oregon gave me their Fighting Spirit Award in 2011, and I won the Community Alliance of Tenants Low Income Housing Champion Award in 2009. I hope you agree with these groups that I have earned a second term. I'm endorsed by Nick Fish and Dan Saltzman, the two council members continuing in office in 2013, and by all five of the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners, as well as Multnomah County Sheriff Dan Staten. They appreciate my proven record of getting results working well with them and with others. The past three years have seen the worst recession most of us have ever experienced, and we are not through it yet. I have kept my commitment to spending taxpayers' money wisely and getting things done. I prioritize funding for jobs and schools, and I engage Portlanders in their government, our government, to make difficult decisions together and achieve results. After all, it's your money. I want to keep serving the people of Portland with a new mayor and a new commissioner in seat four, providing the stability, fiscal responsibility, and common sense that I've demonstrated consistently in my first term. What you have seen from me in three years is what you'll see from me for the next four and more. Thank you for your consideration of voting to re-elect Portland City Commissioner Amanda Fritz on May 15th. Thank you. Ms. Nolan, you may give your closing statement. Portland is a community that aspires to be a great place to raise a family. Whether you work in the corner office or in the cab of a forklift. And that's why people in both those positions are supporting me for this job. We come together to solve problems. I love this city and its progressive values. And I know Amanda does too. So what's the difference? There are just five leadership seats at City Hall and we need each of them to do their share and deliver results that matter. By her own count, Amanda has initiated only 3% of City Council action items while she's been there. She manages less than 5% of City operations, whether you measure it by number of employees or by operating budget. And on the one big assignment she had, to modernize the 911 system, as was reported by the press and by the folks who use the system every day. She spent over $14 million without adequately consulting the 911 operators who dispatch or the police and fire who respond. We really can't afford that kind of mismanagement. The important post of city commissioner isn't a lifetime gig. We have these cool things. They're called elections. When voters get to decide going forward, who they trust to fix what's broken and protect what's working. They want leaders at City Hall with the skill, vision, and backbone to do the hard work of putting Portland back on track. And I'm ready. Amanda does a decent job of studying what's wrong, and that's not a bad first step. 
It's just not nearly enough. I'm keenly focused on fixing problems, not just studying them. This choice is about who you can count on to deliver. I, what I've done over and over again is bring together people with strong personalities and sharp disagreements to solve problems together. I ask you to measure me by the results I've already delivered and the lives I've helped improve as a competent manager and as a leader. Cleaning our river, creating civil unions, doubling college scholarships, supporting and creating local jobs, building health clinics, saving Oregon's farmland and special places, expanding light rail, giving working families the dignity and security they deserve. I'm ready to work with you so our children and their children will have something wonderful to say about the legacy we leave them. I would be honored to have your vote on May 15th. As our President Melody Rose returns to the stage, let's thank both these candidates for a wonderful performance. Thank you. I'd like to give a, a thank you, a deep thank you, to our Truth Squad members, the intrepid Ken Ray, Joyce Demonin, and Pat McCormick. Also, a, a hearty thank you to Jim Westwood for always handling our debates with such a steady hand. And to City Club's own Tony Yaccarino for doing the toughest job of all, that's the timekeeper. Thank you, Tony. And of course, our deepest appreciation to today's debaters, Mary Nolan and Amanda Fritz. We hope you will join us next week so that we can all learn about what the Healthcare Transformation Act means to each one of us. We are adjourned. <laughs>